I am delighted to welcome all of you today to this web chat event on conversational intelligence. This is Julie Annixter, executive editor and co-founder of Innovation Excellence, and I am really happy to be introducing my friend, the author, Judith E. Glazer, who has written um, really an incredible book on conversational intelligence that I think is groundbreaking and that you're going to find very, very interesting for your work and your life. Um, Judith is the chairman of the Creating We Institute. She is CEO of Benchmark Communications. She has been consulting with CEOs and the C-suite for decades. Her clients include American Airlines, American Express, Cisco, Coach, Exxon, IBM. You know, it's a veritable who's who of American corporations. She also serves as an adjunct professor at Wharton, a visiting guest speaker at Harvard, Kellogg, Loyola, University of Chicago, and other institutions. And you may have seen her recently on NBC, on the NBC Today show, where she's been interviewed several times by Charlie Rose and Gail King. Um, Judith is a frequent contributor to many publications. She had an article recently in the Harvard Business Review about being addicted to being right that went viral. Um, so Judith, it is just a pleasure to have you here to share your, your, your new thinking on conversational intelligence with our audience. And it's our next book in our Books as Tools series. Innovation Excellence is committed to sharing books that can really be used to create change. Um, we believe books are tools, and this book, Conversational Intelligence, certainly fits that bill. So Judith, let me start out by asking you, why did you write this book? Julie, first of all, it's so great to be here and having an opportunity to share the work that I've been doing for um, 50 years of my life. And people say, how could that possibly be? You're, you don't look that old, and I love when people say that. Um, <laughs> but what, what it is is that, that um, this work has its origins from the time that I was very little. When I grew up in a family where I didn't quite understand the dynamics that were taking place um, between us. And it, it, there were a lot of things that just didn't make sense until I discovered, and I discovered this somewhere around the time that I was very young, that my father was a stutterer. And stuttering is something that interrupts the conversational flow. It interrupts it for the child who is stuttering and it interrupts it for the people that are um, that they're trying to join with and, and be in, in connection to. And so what I discovered um, about my dad opened up my eyes and created a platform that has launched me forward uh, into the work that I'm doing today. Um, what specifically I learned about my dad was not just that he was a stutterer, um, and when someone stutters they can't talk, as you can imagine, um, and they also then live inside their heads, so they build a world inside of their heads. Um, they can be tremendous thinkers and smart as all get out, which my dad was, which showed later in his life. But the connection of engagement, which helps develop the part of us that is our social being and our humanity, was missing for my dad until he had a teacher when he was in high school. Imagine going all the way through high school, um, not being able to communicate effectively. My dad um, had a teacher that said, I want to help you um, learn how to speak, just like the King's speech. And so she told him that she wanted to make him the star in the, uh, in the school play. And she worked with him. And in working with him, she helped him create, and here's the sort of neuroscience behind this, helped him create a new identity by creating a place in his brain that was fresh and new that didn't have the history of the emotionality that caused his stuttering. The emotionality caused his stuttering was that my grandmother always wanted girls. When my dad was born, he was a twin, and his sister had water on the brain. And so my grandmother... Um, made his, his sister the center of attention. Um, he didn't have an identity that was healthy, pushed the carriage around and all sorts of things. And so um, he, he, became, he had an emotional um, disconnect and was, his identity was built around stuttering. She helped him find a new identity in the role that he took. And when he stepped into that role, he could speak. He had a sense of presence. He had a sense of importance. And as a result of that conversation, which I wanted to study, more than anything else, how did that happen to him? How did he become opened up? Um, he went on to become the valedictorian of his class in college, the head of the debating team. He went on to uh, become a dentist. I always said that was looking down in people's mouths uh, for a reason. 
Um, but he talked and talked. He was a teller. And he learned how to use that in good ways. He went to the government, became an ambassador to the United States, bringing dentistry around the world. We got to go in some of the cases to different countries where he was teaching people dentistry. And he self-taught um, seven languages. People that stutter also have great audio recall, um, which I found out later. So he turned it into a good thing. But in our family, much of what drove the dynamics in our family was that my dad was a teller and um, very specifically telling people what to do when he wanted it to do, when he wanted to do it. And so 6 o'clock was dinner, 6.20 we ended dinner, we spent 10 minutes on the ham radio opera uh, system talking to people around the world. Everything was programmatic and everything was telling. So in my work and in the work of conversational intelligence, I look at interaction dynamics and I look at habit patterns that get created when people are talking with each other and the look at the chemistry or the brain cocktails behind that so that we understand what's driving us to keep repeating things like being addicted to being right in addition to a teller. My dad was always right and, and everybody knows. We know somebody at work who has that addiction. Um, that's what I talked about on the Charlie Rose show on CBS Morning News um, that there is this the, the chemistry behind conversations to make that invisible world visible as part of what this work is all about and the information that, that people learn uh, from this work enables them every day to make decisions about how we want to operate with others in a way that produces positive brain chemistry or activates the parts of our brain that we need to activate to evolve. A quick uh, comment about the ERE project which is the research fellowship that I did at Drexel University. Um, uh, this particular project said let's look at the, let's switch things around, let's flip it. It's not just about what people say but what's the environment that creates the energy for what people say. And so we took children in, nursery, in our nursery school ages two to six and we created a responsive environment and it had people as part of the environment and it has technology as part of the environment. Um, instead of teaching these young kids to read by using stories like the Dick and Jane stories or books that were already published, we said, what if we honored them as human beings? What if we took the stories that they were creating about the world, their world, their inner world, and what if we took those stories and we were trained for six months to be non-judgmental and just listen and record and learn how to interact without pushing judgment, our judgment, our confirmation of what the world was to them. But we let their confirmation of what the world was come to us. And it was that formula that my work has been based on, which is around creating environments, creating the space, filling it with the kind of nutrients that engage people in positive ways and using this to help us grow uh, the fullest part of our brains that are the youngest part, the uh, prefrontal cortex and the connection of that to the rest of the brain to help elevate us into higher levels of intelligence. What this project showed is that the young kids, we followed them for 10 years, quite amazing thing to do. It's, it's a uh, long, called longitudinal studies. These kids, which surprised us most, increased their IQ by 15 points. It didn't matter where they started. We had kids with 85 IQs that jumped over 100. Um, the kids were more socially adjusted. The kids were smarter. They went on to college, all of them. They became valedictorians of their class. They became um, uh, contributors in the world. It, it, what changed for them was so dramatic that I spent the rest of my life trying to figure out how do we interpret all of this and put it into a science, which is now conversational intelligence, that can be used by human beings anywhere in the world. It just doesn't matter what country you live in, that you're going to be able to take source of insight from this work and apply it into everyday life. Needless to say, um, words do make a difference. Uh, words create worlds. And I found out in my first book, which was a dictionary I wrote for Random House, 3,500 new business terms that I had to pull into the mainstream dictionary. Um, what I found is that words have de are defined, they can be defined in the dictionary, like the word collaboration in the dictionary was cohorting with the enemy. Interesting, came from the war. Um, that's why I uh, created the word co-creation or co-creating conversations, which gives us a chance, like with my dad, to create a space for new thinking to occur inside the words that we co-create, inside the words that we create with each other. More words have been created in the world in the last two years than in the history of the world. And so part of conversational intelligence goes from the meanings of words all the way up through the impact that these words and interaction dynamics have on us to help us evolve as human beings. So our agenda today 
is what inspired conversational intelligence, examples of how this works at work, um, the neuroscience of conversations, what's going on behind the scenes, the implications for us, for us as human beings, for us as leaders, and then we'll talk with people about what's on their minds. Needless to say, again, conversational intelligence, I believe, is the most valuable intelligence for our times. It's hardwired. We know that we have the FOXP2 gene, which is a, the gene for language. Animals don't have it. Um, we need to learn how to use it. We need to understand how to create environments that activate um, our capacity to have language and to connect and communicate with each other. And the reason is that conversational intelligence is that hardwired and learnable ability to connect, navigate, and grow with others. It's a necessity in building healthier and more resilient organizations in the face of change. I believe it is what connects all human beings to each other. It connects the past, the present, and the future. And so it is really different than all the other intelligences in that it's something that we can harvest inside of each other through every conversation. And part of what we'll do is take a look at how to make all of this invisible and look at what I mean by spaces. What is that environment all about that activates us? What are the forces that come from human nature that need to be activated or when they are create positive change? And what are the levels of conversation that leaders need to understand so they can help people navigate from one level to the next in order to achieve the transformational goals that we all aspire towards? Spaces is, I think, one of the most interesting parts of this whole story. Um, and what I did is I stepped outside of what it means to be human for a minute and looked at animals and said, well, okay, how much are we really like animals? And it turns out that we are 99% like the rats um, that you see living here um, together in a community. Uh, as a result of that, let's take a look at how rats are impacted in their community and see how to lift that up into human nature. It turns out that some researchers were very smart. They took this family of rats and they divided it in two and they put it in two different spaces. One space was very small, it was underground, both were underground, and the other space was larger. And they came back 48 hours later to take a look and see what these animals were doing. In the space that was small and confined, most of the rats were dead. Actually, they were eating each other because of the activation of the part of their brain, the amygdala, which is a threat. Uh, it, it, it is the threat response and, response and how it gets translated is into people being fighting with each other and in the case of these animals they had no place to flee and so they actually were territorially deprived and they wanted their space and so they were eating other rats to get it. Um, however, in the other space, which was much larger, they, the researchers saw that they were actually working together in a community, supporting each other um, and, and being effective active community participants. They're, they created their tribe and were healthy with each other. And so we take that and say, what does this have to do for the world of human beings? And that is that these are the kind of dynamics that activate the lower part of our brain. And when this happens, it changes our behavior. And for humans, when that happens, it changes our conversations. So let's say, see what else happens um, when human beings get together and live together. But again, through another example, and this time it's with goldfish. Uh, one goldfish was put in a, a big bowl, was able to swim around and own the space, um, lived happily for a while until the researchers decided to add some other fish. So the same space was made smaller by the addition of a family now of fish. They adjusted to each other. They swam around, um, were very happy. And then the researchers did something again. They put a divider, a plexiglass divider, so that one fish was on the right and the rest of the fish were on the left. Fish couldn't go through. We could see each other, as you can see. Um, but three months later, um, they decided to now change the experiment again. Um, while they had adjusted into their little homes, the researchers pulled the plexiglass uh, barrier away to watch what would happen. And I wonder, you know, what happened? We all have to think, okay, now they have the big space, they'll swim around again. But actually, that didn't happen. What did happen is that the fish on the right stayed on the right. The fish on the left stayed on the left. They might look at each other, but they didn't cross over. In the beginning, the researchers fed both sides to see how they were going to thrive, um, because we either thrive or don't thrive in our spaces. And it turned out that the fish um, on, the on the left stayed on the left. The fish on the right stayed on the right. And then the sad part, which we had to find out at the very end, is what would happen if they only put fish, on, uh, fish food on the left as it turned out, the fish on the right never passed over the barrier 
and didn't make it. He did not only um, he he did not only thrive. He did not thrive, and he did not live. And so what this says is that that human beings as well as animals get patterned into the spaces that we live in. And many times we join organizations where we want to thrive and bring our aspirations to life and be contributors and bring our value. That's why we're hired. But many times we see these invisible street signs that say you can't go here, you can't go there, you know, be quiet, um, shut up and, 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 and listen to what we have to say. And those are the kind of environments like the fishes environment that cause us to go into a space whether it's a silo or it's my individual cubby hole, and not understand and not know how to speak up and bring my voice into the voice of change, which is what organizations are really all about. And so what can we do about this? What can we learn about this? Well, what we can learn about is that human beings have forces. Human nature is different than animal nature in, in a variety of ways. We put words to what we're thinking and feeling. Animals can't. And we start to understand that there are forces that drive us differently than, than the animal world. And here are some of the things that are most powerful in the forces that drive human na nature. When human beings interact with each other and we feel a sense of fairness where I give to you and you give to me, that we support each other in many different ways about just being in the world together in, as equals, power with others, I call it. When that fairness is present, human beings thrive. We have a sense of ownership. I own this, you own that. We both have something to own. It gives us, empowers both of us to own and protect what we have, but also to share it with others. So reciprocity becomes one of the forces that drives human nature. I will support you, you will support me. And again, that message gets translated in the brain, in the lower brain, to you're a friend, not a foe. And as a result, the brain literally opens up. It gives us access to what's going on inside of us. Like the young children who felt so rewarded and appreciated were sharing their inner world with us. Being able to validate our inner world is vital and critical to human nature. Then we cooperate with each other and support each other in achieving our mutual goals. Sometimes they're not mutual, but we can still cooperate with each other when we feel that these, these, these forces in human nature are being taken care of when we have a voice and we can express it, and when we feel like we have some status of importance inside of our tribe, when those forces are considered as we interact with each other, then human beings begin to thrive with each other. We grow, we actually activate the epigenetic changes in our being. We literally, literally activate, now we know this is true, we activate the genes that enable us to grow beyond the genetic code that we're given when we're born. So letting people know where they stand with each other has a powerful impact on activating our growth instincts. People interact every day. There's power issues, as you can see in this picture. Um, and even though there are power issues, when we don't respond to the forces on the right, then people become uh, addicted to being right and addicted to their point of view. When we consider the forces on the right, then people start to work together in different ways, just like the, the rats that were able to build community with each other. So let's take a look inside of what's going on behind the scenes, um, a little bit more of the science behind what we're talking about. Um, first of all, we need to know that our brains have cocktails every day, even though we don't drink them in the same way that we would drink alcohol. Um, just having conversations with each other activates these cocktails, and some of those cocktails make us feel good or great, and some of those cocktails make us feel um, depressed, sad, um, and unable to feel that we can find a place in our world, in our community. So we now know that there are billions of conversations that take place each day that stimulate those cocktails. Billions of conversations that make us feel good or not good with each other. Human beings are connected with an energetic field we now know that evolves as we become in sync with each other. There's research that shows that from Princeton University um, that uh, Yuri Hansen and his team um, that as human beings connect, uh, that we connect by connecting positively with each other. Um, the work of Fredrickson is also talking about the positivity of human connection. Um, but when that field begins to create, it activates different parts of our brain. And the more that we connect and understand and appreciate each other, um, the more our brains go into a shared symphony. They, this, they sync. We see patterns that look like your brain and my brain are actually connected. Um, and so we start to have conversations that elevate us up to seeing the world through shared eyes. I can see your world, you can see my world. Because the world is in our heads, 
there is no such thing as reality. Reality is outside of us, but the real reality that we hold is inside of us every day. We build it, we co-create it, um, and, and so the challenge is that nine out of ten conversations miss the mark. We talk past each other, we talk over each other, we stop listening. And all of this is because we're trying to match up our views of the world by confirming what we know, but sometimes that doesn't happen in an easy way. Here, for example, is a typical leader that I work with. I work with leaders all over the world, try to help them uh, open up their minds to seeing the, uh, both the intention that they have, but also the impact that they make. And a lot of times leaders are focusing more on their intention and what they want to say than what they're getting back in their receiving of the signals from people around them to say, I get it or I don't get it. Here was one leader who would walk in every day to work, and I was his coach, and the question was, is he going to be able to be the CEO of a company? Uh, it turned out that they were questioning it because they got feedback from some of the direct reports that he had uh, some way of communicating um, what I call the YSI, which is, you stupid idiot. Now, clearly he wasn't intending to do the YSI on his team in any way, but by coming into work every day with his head down, thinking about what he had on his mind to get ready for work, People were picking up signals when he would look at them and pick up his eyes briefly that they weren't of value, that they weren't important. And they'd spend the day then with that cocktail, that incredible cocktail of feeling threatened, whether they were saying the right thing, they weren't quite sure how to communicate with him. And so the day started before the day started, just with the glance of his eye and his body posture. I worked with him to help him understand what happened at the moment of contact and what signals he was sending um, and he changed his behavior in 24 hours from our coaching session. Walking down the hall would acknowledge people, smiling with his eyes, um, making a sense of today is, is a good day for you and making that sense of connection. Um, within 48 hours, the behavior shifted in his team. I, I can't explain how quickly these types of awarenesses and shifts happen in human beings, that you can literally have a leader change their behavior and that behavior changed the organization instantaneously. Instantaneously, those kinds of changes happen. In fact, let's take a look at what we mean by instantaneously. If you think about how fast change happens, and many, there used to be a time when people said it takes seven years to change an organization. By that time, the organization is not going to thrive or survive anymore because of the speed with which we make changes. But here's what happens inside of human beings at the speed of light. Some things are fast, some things are slow. On the fast side, in 0.07 seconds, something is happening inside of us that can change and transform our future. And some of the things are this. A first impression is made in 0.07 seconds, as it was with these leaders as they were passing each other in the hall. In 0.07 seconds, trust can be lost. Trust lives in the prefrontal cortex and the heart connection. Trust does not live in the whole brain although it requires the brain's activity collectively to make it happen, the, the primary place is in the prefrontal cortex. Some of this work comes from Angelica DeMocha, who is at the Fox School of Business. Um, she manages the neuro decision-making um, uh, group at, at the Fox School of Business. Um, I studied her work. I was um, connected to her through our Creating We Institute, and she is doing amazing work, um, and trust lives in the prefrontal cortex. Distrust lives in the amygdala, the, the reptilian, the, the primitive part of our brain. We need to understand what are the things that trigger this shift from the toggle from trust to distrust. Um, in 0 0.70 seconds, our voice can be lost as a result of it, which is what we saw with those executives interacting with the CEO. Now let's talk about uh, slow, but the slow isn't slow like we think of it. This is 0 0.10 seconds that things can happen that can change our life one second, 10 seconds, all of these things are profound shifts that take place inside of us. Making the invisible visible is so critical. Judgments are made in a nanosecond. Conclusions about other human beings, as soon as we can put a word on someone and say, you're selfish, or you're an idiot, or you know, you're crazy, or whatever the words are we use, it takes a second to say that word, and when someone feels that they're being labeled and judged, something happens in the brain, the cocktail shifts, and often we're unable to have the voice and speak the words that we need to speak to each other to be effective partners. Decisions are made. And what's also fascinating is the world of listening, which in conversational intelligence we spend so much time talking about and understanding. It may be even more 
more, more profound in how we receive others and how we listen to others than how we speak to others. Every 12 to 18 seconds, listening goes inward. As we are, you're hearing me, those of you who are on, on this um, web chat are connecting in your head things that I am saying. It may provoke experiences that you've had with others. It may provoke, provoke an insight or a feeling that you remembered or hadn't remembered for years, and all of a sudden it was brought to the surface. That's what happens when we listen to go inward, and we need to do that to be able to connect with others and to bring our experiences and then share our experiences with others. The impact of this work is profound. It changes the way we think about conversations. It changes the way we think about relationships. It changes the way we think about transforming our organizations. So let's take a look at the inside a little bit more and, and what is the framework that has been created or that I was able to pull out of understanding interaction dynamics from a different point of view, from flipping it over from the talking to the listening, from flipping it over from presenting and from uh, being the strongest voice in the room and learning how to have the strongest voice, to learning how to create environments where we collectively have the voice together. Um, what I learned is that there are three levels of conversations that take place at work. And I think this is part of what makes this work unique and part of what I'm sharing with leaders and part of what makes it easier to see the world around us and to see these interaction dynamics more clearly. Level one is where we confirm what we know. That's where we are doing telling and asking. This is what I learned when my dad was a teller, that he was mostly a teller, not an asker. And it causes, this particular level causes us to think in a transactional way with each other, not necessarily pulling in all of what we could know from each other, but confirming what we do know. The second level is about defending. This is about persuading others. This is about advocating and inquiring and we do this at work every day. Many people tell us, tell me that most of the organizations they work in live in level one or level two, persuading others of what they believe is the direction to go in their organizations. Many leaders that I've worked with sometimes get caught in the advocating um, and inquiring dynamic because they want to move people in a certain direction. And when they get frustrated, especially, they move more into strengthening and defending their point of view and trying to sell each other on what that idea is. So you've got to be saying at this point, what's the better place? Is there a better place? And I have to say that all of the places, all of the levels are important. We have to use all of them to get to where we need to go. The one that is the most challenging and the most exciting and the one that brings us the most potential is level three, which is where we live in a place of discovery and curiosity with each other, where we share and discover what we know, but most of all, we call upon each other to share and discover what we don't know. When we're in level three, we're asking questions for which we don't have answers. We're living in a space of openness and courageousness to be honest and open with each other and seek to learn that which we don't know yet from each other and incorporate that into our everyday life. This is the power that activates much more of the whole use of our brain. It's not the 10% that people talk about, but it's as much of 100% as we can call upon. Level one uses more of the neocortex. This is where we know what we know. Um, but level three is the transformational level that uses the prefrontal cortex, the green part of our brain, and also pulls in the, um, the heart. So the heart connection is what actually, the heart prefrontal connection is what actually starts to activate a different part of our brain. When the heart is activated, we send more afferent nerves to the brain than the brain does down to the heart. We start to get into sync with others when the heart prefrontal cortex is activated. We actually modulate the prefrontal cortex's control abilities to include empathy. There are at least 11 different functions that take place in that part of the brain that if we're not activating that part of the brain with the heart connection, we're not using it. And so empathy, intuition, trust, integrity, the ability to handle strategic conversations where we toggle between what we desire, our aspirations, and what we get, and to do that in a positive and effective way it lives in that part of the brain. And too often we end up falling back into defending what we know or what we believe is true, rather than strategically integrating what we know with what others know. And so um, level two is where we often get trapped and hooked into addicted to being right, and so conversational intelligence gives us the template to look at all three levels, to understand how to actively use and move through all three levels. 
because that, in fact, what enables us to activate our intelligence, our collective intelligence. What happens when we do and what happens when we don't? Um, what Angelica DeMocha's work teaches us is that we have fear networks where distrust lives, we have trust networks where trust and, and, and all of these other incredible, incredible capacities live when we're in a place of candor and caring with each other, empathy, and so forth. We activate what's called mirror neurons, which also live in the prefrontal cortex. And we now know from um, the study of mirror neurons that when human beings step into each other's world, when we activate the ability to mirror what others see in their brains and accept that, not judge that, but live in that space with other human beings in their world, something triggers in our brain to activate our ability to have higher powers of cognitive, spiritual, and emotional abilities with others. So wouldn't it be amazing if leaders learned how to move in and out of level one, two, and three with each other where it's appropriate? Wouldn't it be amazing if people had the ability to understand how the fear networks lock us down, lock, a, lock down our brain, close the door to the part of our brain that we need to be effective and con amazing contributors in the workplace? And wouldn't it be amazing if we understood how to activate oxytocin, which is a bonding hormone? It's the most frequently produced hormone in the body. Bruce McEwen from uh, Rockefeller University is studying all of the neurotransmitters. And it's, it's fascinating to see how much positive interaction with other human beings activates the kind of chemistry, the cocktails, that enable us to engage more effectively. Oxytocin, when it was sprayed into children that are autistic, activates their ability to collaborate with each other. Never known before that we could turn on and turn off that ability for kids that we thought were going to be living in the world, their own world, but could now learn how to engage in the collective world. This is true for all human beings. It's absolutely a phenomenal bit of research that's now coming out. In fact, all of the science is science that has been evolving over the last 50 years. I would collect tidbits from the time I was young to try to understand why and how something can change so quickly in the moment. Why and how, when I worked at an orphanage where the kids were not doing well in school, and after three months, the headmaster called me in and said, what did you do to my kids? And I said, what's wrong? What did I do to your kids? And she said, these are, these are girls who are not doing well in school. They're now coming back with A's and B's. What happened? And what I talked about to her, I didn't know then. Now I know the science, and, and this is what we're sharing today, is that you activate different parts of the brain when you care about human beings, when you respect them. Um, now people are using the word love in the workplace. When you love them and honor and respect their point of view, something changes, that chemistry changes, but it activates people's ability to learn and grow and navigate with each other. Heart has something to do with it. We're now able to bring the heart into the workplace and study it as a science. Um, it's not something that is soft. It's something, it's the hard science of everyday life that we're now finally understanding. The amygdala gets hijacked. We go into our lower brain. We need to activate the prefrontal cortex collectively to activate the whole brain. These are the parts of the brain. The limbic is the emotional brain, the neocortex. So conversational rituals is part of what the book teaches us to do. It says that we can prime for trust. We can learn the, the rituals that bring human beings together in a positive way. We can learn how to co-create and have co-creating conversations where high trust lives. We can learn how to look at the expectations or the, the gaps that we have between what we expect and what we get and learn how to have conversation around bringing people to, to be able to deal with those gaps not necessarily in ways that cause people to feel like stupid idiots with each other, but that help us activate things that are resident inside of us that can be triggered by everyday conversation. One of the rituals that I talk about a lot in the book is the trust ritual. Interestingly enough, it uses the T-R-U-S-T -T as a mnemonic, um, but it in fact actually does bring us to the higher powers of trust. And with trust, our brain opens up and we share and co-create with others. Transparency is the first part of the model. Um, we now know that when human beings open our kimonos to each other, it sends signals to the lower brain that says that I want to be friend, not foe. Transparency as a ritual in organizations used effectively can alone radically shift the chemistry in an organization where people start to bond comfortably with each other. Relationships is the next one, and I talk about having the forming relationships before doing tasks. So much we jump into the room, we start doing the, the tasks with others, we give each other uh, their to-dos and your to-dos, 
and so forth. But what people need to know first is how do I have a relationship with you? Where do I stand with you? What roles will you take? What roles will I take? And how do we handle when things don't go right? When that gets established, you can have your gaps. They can show up, but people deal with them in a completely different way. Understanding is stepping into the world of other human beings. That's what activates the mirror neurons, learning how to practice that at work, spending more time asking questions for which we don't have answers takes us into level three. That level of understanding is different than level one or level two where we're confirming or defending what we know. Leaders who um, are addicted to being right, leaders who want to be right, all of us, tend to go quickly into, I got it, I got it, I know what you're thinking, rather than spending more time in that space of understanding. When we activate the true part of the brain, the transparency, relationships, and understanding, then when we go for shared success, we don't get caught in a common rut in organizations, which is uh, consensus building or group think. When we don't prime the brain for the first three activities to take place, then often shared success seems like it's shared success, but it's only a smaller version of what shared success could be. It doesn't have the richness of our collective thinking. It doesn't have the opportunity to open up things we hadn't yet thought about together. And so the final T is truth telling. And when we tell the truth to each other about what's working and what's not working, and we're honest about how we feel, and we do it in the context of caring, something shifts in the brain, something shifts in our organizations, and we elevate our capacity to think collectively in ways we had never done before. I believe that this is the true foundation for co-creating an innovation in the world today. It's going to create the disruption that we need to become masters of our fate and captains of our soul. So what I do also in the book and what I love to give to people to use are the conversational tools. Um, so what if we could make the invisible visible for everybody? What if this was really true, that when we're in a place of protection, we're resistors and we live in a place of our lower brain where we're actually listening for the threats so we can protect ourselves? If that's the case, then we're in low trust. And if that's the case, then we're not activating the part of our brain that we need to bring to work to be smart partners. And what if people could see that? What if they can see when people are being skeptical or and asking questions or questioning others' point of view? But what if we could think that skepticism is not necessarily shouldn't isn't to, to, to cause me to react and defend? But what if skepticism is somebody raising questions that are big and important to get us all to think bigger together? And what if wait and see, which is where we're trying to figure out what the answers are? And what if that, instead of being a place of fear, generally we go into uncertainty when we're in wait and see, we look around for who the leaders are, we stand behind the person that has the most power, and we start to get into positional listening and positional conversations. But what if we could learn that wait and see was a place to us, for us to open up and to think differently, to think more open, and to be able to take in new information? And what if we could learn how to be experimenters with each other? Experimenters is spelled differently for a reason, to be mentors of the experiment. What if we could work together and support each other in taking risk and being courageous and trying things we've never tried before so we could learn from them, even if they are mistakes, that we could learn from them in order to become more effective in the next round of efforts and experiments that we do with each other. Every amazing drug in the world has come from making mistakes. So we have to encourage people to be experimenters with each other. And when we do that and we move into co-creation, something magical happens. Our brains connect in ways that we could never imagine before. We find synchronicity living in the world and living in organizations. People learn how to calm each other in order to enable voices to be heard. Trust is high and we support and respect each other. And listening at its is at its best. We understand the neurochemistry, which is one level, the relational, which is another level, and the co-creational, which is another level. We learn how to move from level one to level two to level three with each other and learn how to toggle back and forth in order to bring people into conversations that need to be part of the conversation rather than having them feel excluded. So what are the major conversational shifts that we can do, those of us who are listening in today, can do to experiment and become experimenters in the world of conversational intelligence? The first one is we, we understand we have to run laps with each other. You have to build up the stamina to live in level three together. You have to practice what it takes to get there. So the first thing you can practice is listening to connect, not reject. When you listen to connect, you're listening to find ways that you and others have things in common or that you want to find things where you can build together. 
when we reject and we think other person's point of view is not ours, therefore we don't agree with them. That chemistry, the but chemistry that we see in organizations, that's great but, triggers the part of our brain that causes us to move back into our reptilian brain. So number one is listen to connect. Number two is asking questions for which you have no answers. It's not the questions that cause us to confirm what we know or to defend what we know, but it's the questions that are the big provocative questions, like what could be going on in the world if we did this. Begin to think about questions, and I have worksheets for, for people who are interested in diving into conversational intelligence with provocative thought-starting questions which get people to think bigger and broader, even if they don't have the answers. Learning how to prime for conversations for mutual success. How do you create the room space before you come in? How do you bring people in with pre-work before you come to a meeting? These are the kind of things that prime the conversational space for mutual success. How to learn how to sustain conversational agility. That means to be able to refocus, redirect, rename, relabel, all those wonderful rewords that leaders need to learn how to do so when the conversations are stuck, anyone can learn how to call it out in the moment and say we're stuck, we need to move into this space to give us some more air to think together. Um, actually disengaging is one of the conversational agility techniques. Let's say, let's disengage for a while, go back into our small teams, think it through, and come back with new ideas. There's so many things that we can do to change conversations from talking over and talking past to talking with others. Moving into level one, level two, and level three is important, but knowing that level three is the transformational space to go in collectively that activates our executive brain and our heart in order to access higher levels of intelligence. So why is this important now for all of you? We work together. The world is collective consciousness growing together. It's all about being connected. It's all about transforming our reality. It's all about accessing each other's greatest thinking and to bring that to the table. We have habit patterns that get in the way. In a nanosecond, we can become tellers if it gets rewarded by others, if people sit and listen and, and emulate us to the point that we are the most charismatic emperor in the room. Yes, that becomes a habit pattern and we love to replicate it. Um, but change is going on in the world. We have to build healthy cultures. The relationship between cancer cells and healthy cells is something that my husband has studied for years. What we're learning is that there is a, is a symphony going on at the lower levels of our cells that where cells are living in toxic environments and human beings are living in toxin, toxic environments that closes down the cells and closes down the organizations. Culture at the cellular level and culture at the human level have, have a lot in common. And the more we learn about what those similarities are, the more we can not only change a human culture in everyday life, but we can actually activate the internal culture that causes us to be healthy or not healthy inside and internally. All of this is about growth. We're moving into the time in our world where growth is what drives the world. And clearly there's an impact on, on the economics, but the story is not just an economic story. It's a rich, full, robust story. The big well is this. What I finally realized out of all of this is we don't have to get stuck anymore. We don't have to get stuck in habit patterns that aren't working. We don't have to um, end up um, asking everybody that's not performing to leave in organizations. Yes, we have to make choices. Some fits are not right for us, but there's a power behind conversational intelligence that enables us to learn how to understand level one and level two and level three for what it brings into the world to understand when people are confirming what we know, because we at some point need to do that in order to trust ourselves. We need to defend what we know when we need to push forward and move people into action. This is all part of conversational intelligence, but we need to also discover the what ifs and the what we don't knows, so we don't get caught up in denial. And there's a lot of research now on biases, cognitive biases and denial. When we think we're the best in the world, we stop attending to what's happening new around us. So if we can learn how to toggle between the levels, we build a conversational agility, and agility is the most researched dimension of leadership success in the world right now. So bringing conversational agility into the world, helping us all become able to toggle with each other and to navigate with each other is a profound thing for us to be focused on together. For me, it was the big wow when this all came together. Um, wouldn't it be great if everybody at every level, every level in an organization could begin to think about the power that they can bring to their organizational growth and development. 
So conversational shifts are a lot about the I, how leaders can transform their um, conversational intelligence in their organizations. The we is about how teams can transform with CIQ. And, and the us is about how our organizations can transform as well. Um, Julie, I wanted to check back with you and find out if you'd like to take a break um, and take some questions or if you'd like me to tell some stories. You know, um, I think, Judith, it would be great to hear at least one story because th this work comes out of, you know, 20, 30 years of you working with teams and companies like Verizon, Lockheed, and Claire also. Let's hear a couple stories and then we can go to questions. Okay. Um, I want to tell a, a Verizon story. I love Verizon um, uh, for so many reasons. And, and I love this story because the executive who, who picked me to work with him, I know it was frustrating. He interviewed 30 co excuse me, 13 coaches before um, he picked me. And I asked him why he picked me. And he said, um, everybody jumped in wanting to help me get better. And he said, you jumped in saying, we have to do this together. We have to figure out what all of this data and research that people have done around you, what all of it means, and I can't do it alone, and we can't assume that what is there is, the, is there. And so I opened it up to create the neutral space. That's the space that I learned to, to, to find when I was doing my work at the Edison Responsive Envi Environment at Drexel. And it makes a difference when we start with that neutral space in order to build a relationship. Anyway, we, we started to work together and what he didn't realize that while he was a high-performing leader and that was his mindset around what he did um, and he did so many things to push his people to read about leadership and to, to, to do all the things um, that would help them grow he sent them home with articles to read um, he got them on the telephone with their clients in Europe when it was Thanksgiving because he knew that that would make the clients feel bad they didn't celebrate Thanksgiving I mean he had so many activities that he did that he thought were positive transformative leadership activities but what he didn't realize was the neurochemistry behind it. In pushing his people to be to raise the bar so high, he was causing health problems in his team. One guy actually ended up in the hospital with a um, signs of a heart attack, and and um, it was very serious. And that's what opened up the other people to talk on the team about it. The good news is that in three months um, he was able to transform his behavior so radically that the following year he continued to be went back up to be considered the best leader. Um, in his team of seven people. What he did and why conversational intelligence excites me so much is I had him look at the interaction dynamics that he was creating. He was a high teller, as I described to my dad, um, and he was telling people what to do all the time, not realizing that there wasn't an interaction back with him for people to get it and to get in the game. And in one of his meetings, I had him shift, downregulate, I call it, the telling behavior and upregulate the asking behavior and to do it with clear, clean intention to engage his people in the conversation and to listen without judgment. And he did this. And the very next day I got a call from all of his people independently. They didn't know that each of them was calling me. And the first one said to me, what did you give my boss to drink? So when we think about conversational cocktails, we think that conversations can change the inner spaces of people in the same way that drinking can change it. They were elated. They were on a high. They couldn't believe it, and their only comment was, can we keep this going? This is exactly what we need. So that was the, that's the Verizon story. I've had hundreds of stories like this with companies and, and executives. The Lockheed story is, is pretty profound because at the time I worked with Lockheed, it was a team of 65 people that were bringing in a new ERP system. Uh, the five divisional presidents were concerned because their legacy systems were giving them the results they wanted in managing the behind the scenes um, of their aerospace business. But when they pulled it together into one system, some of the leaders felt that they were fearful. They had feared implications that they were going to lose in the, the external race uh, when they were competing against their customers because the system didn't work the way the system that they knew worked. And so they went into protect behavior, defending level one and level two, defending their own positions about how this system could work. And they were in deadlock. Deadlock so serious that they were burning a million dollars a day in indecision. And I did the uh, intervention with them 30 days after um, they started to calculate the amount of loss, revenue loss. We spent a day together. I introduced them to conversational intelligence. I had them understand that um, in the circle of knowledge, there's some things you know, some things you don't know, and there's some things that you don't know you don't know, but also, and that's blind spots, and that's the biggest area, but there are also 
things that you don't know you know. And I said, we're going to spend an hour and a half together, all 60, 65 of you living in a world of discovery, living in a world of curiosity, living in a world with each other, of stepping into each other's shoes and understanding each other's world so that we can begin to create what collective success would look like. And I walked around the room tapping people on the shoulder when I heard that they were going back into level one or level two and said, I want you to live into level three and spend your more time in discovery. And at the end of an hour and a half, they had an extraordinary breakthrough in the room. And they were able to um, move through the, 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 um, the deadlock and, and make a decision and make decisions that impacted their whole organization. So wow. Luckily, I mean, That's amazing. It, Absolutely yeah. amazing. It's an amazing story, Julie, and it's the kind of thing that the technology inside of this is, is built around helping people see what the dynamics are, being able to call them out, know which ones are closing the brain, which ones are opening the brain, and then helping people learn how to upregulate certain chemistry and downregulate it so that you're actually changing the cocktails, the, the brain cocktails that are, that are inside of human beings, and then people released it to be creative geniuses that we all have the capability to be. Um, wow. Yeah. The, the well, last... I, can I yes, just say, please, quickly please, go ahead. Yeah. When I when I started to work with Clairol, um, they weren't sure they were going to be in business. Um, they were a two hundred fifty million dollar company. People didn't want to dye their hair anymore. Naturals was the big thing. And to make the story, uh, to shorten the story, we created an environment. Again, it's how do you neutralize the conversational space and get everybody in it together? We bit the, built a Clairol news network where the CEO and senior teams and success stories were flooded throughout the organization, helping people understand what it would mean to be a category leader. Um, the kinds of things that the breakthroughs and the experimentations that they did by creating what's called the color choice system, which was a disruptive technology. They brought into the space where retail space, the ability to put their, their products out in a way that the customer can interpret with them the light color to the dark color, what to buy. They changed the chemistry. They invited their competitors to be on the shelf with them. They did everything to break the rules about how to buy at retail. Um, and their innovation soared. They literally invented products that never existed in the world. They changed the nature of hair dye to hair color. As you know, it's now called hair color. They expanded their market share down to kids, believe it or not, to put lights in their hair good or bad, <laughs> men to be able to change the color of their hair. Everything changed when Clairol decided to expand the conversation, teach people how to challenge the status quo, capture best practices throughout the organization, and create power with others at every level. It wasn't about hierarchy. They changed the dynamic in every way possible. Clairol went to 4.5 million, was bought, bought by Procter & Gamble. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful success story that everybody can do when you start to put into practice some of these energy releasing um, uh, rituals that, that actually extraordinarily change the brain and change an organizational space. Now back to you, Julie. Oh, well, there's so many great questions. I, I'm going to start with this one, Judith. Um, mm -hmm. By creating a safe, non-judgmental, trust-based space for trustful conversation, are we actually rewiring our brain? and creating new pathways for trust that override or erase the old distrustful ones? We are, the first thing we need to know is that, that we are, the, the end of the game is that we are, we have the potential to rewire the brain. By rewiring it means the more we do something, we create a habit pattern. So the more we can learn how to see when, when we're triggering distrust and then learn the rituals of building people into trust, the more the brain is going to start to wire for trust more quickly. We have to overcome billions of years when we were animals, when everything was about protection, when everything was about holding on to what I have. And so we are now in a time and space when human beings collectively can work together to activate and rewire those networks so that it's easier to get to. It's instant, more instantaneous to see the signs of, oh my God, I'm in distress. Let's start to, to work this way and literally change the conversation. So yes, it, it, if somebody were to take a look at brains 100 years from now and people were to practice these kinds of activities, the DNA gets changed. Now we're knowing that epigenetics, epigeneticist does take place. Epigenetic changes are happening. The next generation benefits from repatterning re um, these pathways. It's absolutely amazing. There's su such an emphasis um, in the last decade on collaboration, <clears throat> co-creation, um, you know, working together, um, you know, 
platforms like Kickstarter. And what I love about your book is it really explains why people are so drawn to this kind of work and why it's become um, so much a part of, you know, thankfully, of our, of our society and our work culture. Mm -hmm. um, here comes a very pragmatic question from, from Ariana. Um, she asks, by, cre by creating, um, no, excuse me, she says, I am curious uh, how you recommend simplifying the integration, of lear the integration and learning of conversational intelligence in organizations. So how do you recommend actually bringing this in? And I'm going to guess um, that reading the book is a, is a good first start. Um, it's, it's a beautiful question because um, there are ways to simplify conversational intelligence. That's part of what I have in the book are a variety of tools, frameworks, um, like the conversational dashboard, which can be put in rooms and people can talk about where are you on the dashboard and what do you need to move into a higher level ex of experimentation with each other. So instantly read the book, use the frameworks, talk about level one, two, and three, which I'm doing with clients every day. And once people have that language, it's giving people words that we've never used before to frame up what we're thinking. And when you share level one, two, and three, people will tell you, oh my goodness, now that explains why. And that's what I wanted to do was activate the internal wisdom that human beings already have about this science. And then beyond that, if people want to learn how to um, become coaches inside of organizations or consultants inside of organizations or learn how to bring, you know, 350,000 people in an organization or 20,000 people or, or 10 people together, there are practices we're certifying people in that they can learn how to become masters of, of CIQ. But know that the book is a great place to start because it gives practical things that you can do starting tomorrow. Here's one from Leo that is very interesting. Um, is conversational intelligence applicable to phone conversations and email correspondence? I ask, he says, because there's a lot of distrust in not face-to-face -face conversations. Right. Uh, and I hear stories all the time about people when I say, tell me what your behavior is like when you're on, uh, on a conference call. And they said, you mean uh, how many clicks I'm putting into my phone, how many things I'm doing on my computer that nobody can see? Well, I'm semi-listening. Yes, we all, we all do that. And those behaviors are distracting because most of us can hear in the background people are clicking away and we know it, it's not effective. However, there are conversational rituals that you can do. I did some work with a, um, uh, a, a company years and years and years ago, 10 years ago actually, on how to create the space when we're in a conversation together on the phone. And you can actually do rituals where ask people to draw a circle on a piece of paper. Uh, if it's a small group, you identify where people are sitting on the circle so that you actually visualize, you bring the visual into your world, you activate the mirror neurons by bringing a visual of where people are sitting into the room and you set into place the conversational rules of engagement for how we're going to um, talk with each other and how we're going to work with each other on the phone. We can do that. We don't necessarily have, a lot of people don't do it, but these rituals work inside of the, um, the teleconference space and they work inside of, of any time when we're not face to get face to face together, as long as we, we begin to bring that visual of what it means to be face to face together and establish some of the conversational rituals together. Make sense, Julie? Wow. Yeah, it totally does. It's absolutely fascinating. And um, a lot of tools like GoToMeeting and WebEx, et cetera, allow for even showing the visuals, which uh, you know, kind mm -hmm. of adds another wrinkle to that. Mm -hmm. Here's another question that um, is sort of in the same vein. What are this is this comes from Robin? What are the implications of social media and the impact here? Does it hinder or assist? So here's what I think is happening. Let me be on record. This is I already I, I talked about this on one of the other CBS shows that I did about social media um, because I have a different point of view than a lot of people, and that is yes. While we're seeing that social media. We're seeing that uh, tweeting and 144 characters and all this kind of stuff when people are talking to each other in a meeting through uh, their phones, it's all distracting because it's new and we're just, it's like a toy we can't stop playing with. It's, it is actually producing oxytocin every time we interact with someone and connect with them. So it's being reinforced by that and by dopamine. So we're driven to do more of it. But we're also seeing everywhere, like you asked the question, that it's time now to step back and say, I think what do we do with this technology and how do we make it work for us? So I say that this time in history in our evolution is the looking back to look forward time 
where we have to go backwards to go forwards. We have to connect to then learn how to make that connection work. And I love it that everywhere I go, people are asking this question, which means we're elevating our consciousness. It's a good thing. Now, how do we make it work for us, not against us? Does that make sense? It, it totally, totally makes sense. And, and I'm going to shift us back to the corporate world. There are a number of questions about um, can conversational intelligence be used to manipulate people? And how do you deal with difficult, um, difficult behaviors? How do you confront them? How can you get the message across to a bully colleague within the corporate world? So maybe you could address, Judith, how to use conversational intelligence to ease um, conversations and make conversations better because there are a number of questions that, um, that deal with that. That's clearly a concern among people. Yeah, so here, here's the story. Um, we know that people like my dad who was, a, who was a stutter and who got into a pattern of telling. We know a lot of time, or the Verizon leader who, who was telling people what to do all the time. We know that, that human beings get into patterns. Even bullies, for example, people that are bullies are probably, and I know because I coached a bully actually, and I found out the bully had a sister. The sister was more powerful than he was and everybody gave her attention and he was the kind of the meeker one. And so he became a bully later in his life because it was his action against the reaction that he had. And he swore that he would never have that happen to him again. So a lot of the behaviors that we have difficulty with, even people that are manipulating, are people that have some pattern in their life. And I'm not a psychotherapist, but I do know um, with the work of Dan Siegel, um, that talks of, looks at, at attachment disorders, that a lot of this happens in, in our growing up and then we see the patterns manifest in our full life. What I found in when I work with bullies um, is that they are not consciously aware of the impact they're having on others because they're trying to feed their need. And so part of what this work is about and in the coaching side of the work that we do around conversational intelligence is to help people get in touch with that need that they have and then help them transition over into uh, another pattern of behavior, just like you heard me talk about with my dad. What's a pattern of behavior that can give you and address that need in a healthier way? And a lot of times these leaders don't know the impact they're having on others. And so by helping them develop what I call the third eye, where you can learn to connect, here's my intention, here's the impact, and see the impact on others, not interpret it in your head about what you want to have happen, but start to observe, like I learned how to do, observing the dynamics, we all can learn how to do this, that new pathway gets created for the bully or the manipulator or the people who have a strong need that they're trying to, to handle. And, and they are literally re rewiring and remapping their own brains when that happens. I had one guy that I coached who was a horrible bully. Um, there was everything about his behavior was arrogant, too, uh, um, over the top on his importance and so forth. And three weeks into our coaching, um, I, I finally got the aha from him, and I hear this a lot from, from the, the clients that I work with, he said, what did you do to, to change my brain? Yesterday I was thinking one way, today I'm thinking another way. I said, what are you thinking? He said, for the first time I can see around me people showing the behaviors that I used to show that were so ugly and didn't know they were there. He said, I can see people show up now in those behaviors and I don't like it. And that's closing the, the loop. This is a cybernetic loop that when human beings learn to close that loop between what they're thinking, what they're seeing, and the feedback loop, the cybernetic loop, they see the world a different way and in many times they see the world in a healthy way. So even bullies can learn how to self-regulate, turning, activating the mirror neurons, activating their ability to downregulate certain emotions and behaviors. This is the, the place that we're all in now. This is accessible for every human being. We can control the gas. We can control the brakes. We can upregulate. We can downregulate. This is the science of conversational intelligence. Does that does that handle some of the questions? Well, it's profound, and I, I really yes, it mm. it does, and it's profound. And Judith, I'm just going to ask you if you can to click forward to the last slide so people can get your email address and see where they can contact you. And and as um, and perhaps you want to use this quote because I know you love it. So I'm going to okay. pause and let you read it. Okay. Um, for all of us, what's the most important thing behind all of this work is that we all want to get to the next level of greatness. That's what we're designed to do. We all have aspirations that we'd like to achieve. So getting to the next level of greatness depends on the quality of the culture, which depends on the quality of relationships, which depends on the quality of the conversations. Everything happens through conversation. And so for 
uh, we learned a lot today about building trust and helping people listen and overcoming resistance and pushing back and catalyzing new thoughts and changing minds and shifting I to we and activating energy and passion and accountability. Um, if people are more interested in learning more um, and want to go deeper, the way to reach me is either at je glazer at creatingwe.com or visiting the creatingwe.com website, which you can explore, or conversational intelligence website to read about all the articles that are now coming out about this work. Um, and feel free to share them with everybody. But I'm opening this offer to people on the phone to reach out and connect. And, and I just want to mention, Judith, that this um, web chat is, has been recorded, and it will be available at uh, www.conversationalintelligence.com and at innovationexcellence.com. It has been profound. I have enjoyed it. I know everyone on the, uh, on the phone has enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you so much. This was really, really a wonderful experience to hear you take us through you know, the years of research and thinking you've been doing on this really important really really important subject. Julie thanks for having me it's been it's been 50 years of work and um, I'm finally finding my voice I had 20 books rejected before this book was published <laughs> and oh, it was wow. all because they said you don't know enough about neuroscience you're not a neuroscientist who are you to have this voice and so finally um, well I didn't go to medical school I've been surrounded by some of the most amazing neuroscientists who have helped me bring this work um, down to earth and I'm thrilled I'm thrilled to be here today well, thank you so much, and, and thanks to our audience uh, and everyone who's participated with us today. We look forward to seeing you in the future, and uh, with that, Judith, thank you, and we'll sign off.